Today we're going to continue in Acts, and uh, the part about Acts that, that is so great to see is just the history of what's next for God's people. And Jesus, when He was here, uh, instituted something called the church, uh, specifically His church, and that church has continued to expand in Acts. After He gave His announcement and His declaration for what the church was to do in Acts 1-8, which we'll look at shortly, Um, they're off. And continually the church is just expanding from the beginning of Acts. And so today's passage is yet another expansion of the church. But it's a shining example of how the church is blessed by God. You know, your shining examples, your standouts today, uh, I say that because in, in so many ways you could have been other places. This is a long weekend. This is Memorial Day weekend. And so you guys have stuck it out, said no, church service is important. And uh, you're the standouts. You're the, you're the ones that I, I am proud to be in front of. Though at the same time we love our brothers and sisters who did uh, take time and vacation. But um, it, in this passage today uh, is the first time that the believers in Christ are called Christians. And so they probably get first dibs to be closest to the Lord, but I'm going to call you the Memorial Day weekend church-going Christians. Okay, it's a long title, but I think it gets the point and it's an honor to be with you. But in all seriousness, the church is being blessed greatly in our passage today. Which leads, I think, to some good questions. What does a church blessed by God look like? What would it do? Do we have to guess? What would be honoring to the Lord as a church? Do we have to guess what He would say if Jesus were to come down and speak to us about this is what a blessed church looks like? The beauty of it is we don't have to guess. We actually get to look in God's Word, in the Scriptures, and see what God would say is a blessed church. So would the culture define it differently? Probably. Uh, But one of the things that I'm sure the culture would define success in a church or a blessed church would be in numbers. Um, If you've been at Carolina for a little while, you've probably seen that that we've been blessed and growing in members. Uh, But I want to go a step bigger to tell you a little bit about our denomination's growth for a moment. Uh, The PCA, the Presbyterian Church of America, is mainly made up of small to mid-sized churches. We have some larger churches, but primarily we're small to mid-sized. And uh, those are the churches that seem, according to America... American church polls are in the decline. Matter of fact, 85% of American churches are declining or not growing. 85%. But based on a report by the PCA Admin Committee, we have planted, listen to this, in the last five years, the PCA has planted over a thousand churches in America. In the last five years. And also the the members have continued to grow over the past five years, both in those churches that have been planted and the ones that were already existing. Uh, Membership in these churches have been uh, on the steady increase as a whole. The Pope uh, just wrote or or put out an article that said they are in dire need of clergy, which is like church leaders for the Catholic Church, and saying there's just not enough people coming. Uh, We have way too many people in need that aren't being ministered to by these leaders, and yet uh, the PCA is continuing to ordain and graduate from their seminaries fine uh, young people to lead the church of the PCA. Matter of fact, uh, yesterday we had a graduation uh, at RTS in Charlotte, Reformed Theological Seminary, and one of our very own interns, Corey Kuhn, graduated, and that's a big feat, so proud of him and proud that he represents uh, the young people that are coming in to serve the church. The PCA is growing in that way as well. Everywhere you look, you see statistics of youth decline. If you read any article, youth are not coming to church. Youth are are moving away from the church. People are graduating and going off to other places. But if you look at the PCA, um, this report, we have a steady increase of children joining our PCA churches in the last five years. It's something to be excited about. Even by American culture standards, it seems as if the Lord is on the move. He seems to be blessing our denomination with an increase in people, but again, is that all that the church is when they're blessed? Is it just about people or more people coming and joining? Uh, What other measurements is there of a blessed church? Is it possibly uh, churches that are continuing to grow in resources and finances? Is that 
Is that the measure that the Bible gives us for a successful and blessed church? Is it maybe by what we can see? Is it more visible buildings? Oh, we're growing and, and see that church over there just put in that new building? God's surely blessing them. Is that, is that the measure that the Bible gives for a blessed church? Is it solely just lots of people, one to Christ? It's certainly something to celebrate. But is that the only thing that the church is called blessed for? If they're gaining converts? Or is it something more? What does it mean to be a church blessed by God? The passage today highlights a special church. The story of Acts, in fact, in this moment is shifting. Uh, We have heard of one church primarily up to chapter 11. It's the Jerusalem church. And it's what the Jerusalem church is choosing to do as far as Gentiles that are coming to faith or people that aren't Jews coming to faith and do you circumcise? Do they didn't do our laws and rituals? Or do we accept them? And we're seeing a lot of good things happen. Even with the Jerusalem church, they're accepting uh, other people that God is clearly blessing and, and blessing with the Holy Spirit, in fact. But here you have a shift from the Jerusalem church to this other church called the Church of Antioch. And this church is going to become the limelight church for the rest of Acts because, in fact, this is the church that blesses the nations. This is the church that takes one of the greatest missionaries in the entire Christian history, Paul, the Apostle, uh, and and sends him out on his journeys. The church of Antioch is made up of not just Jews, but Greeks. And we're going to look at them today in a special light. In fact, one of the things that they do is they are fulfilling the Acts 1-8 passage that I talked about earlier. If you haven't done this in your Bible and you're one who writes notes in your Bible, I would go to Acts 1.8 and I would make a note there that that is the plan. That's the church plan in Acts. What, he's going, what the Holy Spirit through people um, are going to do. And Acts 1.8 says, in fact, where Jesus is speaking to His disciples, He, he tells them that, that He's going to be with them and that He's going to bless them with the Holy Spirit. And then He says, you will be My witnesses. And this is where... We're at, at this point, I'm going to lead us to it. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's where we've been. In Judea and Samaria. It's kind of the middle area, just the suburbs, if you will. And to the ends of the earth. We see the ends of the earth coming now through Antioch. Now to be clear though, the mission of God to bless the world does not start in Acts. The mission of God to bless the world, in fact, does not start with the Gospels. The mission of God to bless the world starts in the beginning. So if you'll turn with me for your Old Testament reading in Genesis, we're going to look at a passage. The mission of God to bless starts in the Old Testament. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we go back and we see that God is a God who makes promises. We also call them covenants. But throughout the Bible, the the Bible shows us that God is in control And he makes promises. And this mission of God doesn't start with the church. It starts with one man named Abraham. So we're going to look at Genesis chapter 12, verses, I'm going to do chapter or verse 1. It says 2 and 3 in your bulletin. So starting at verse 1, now the Lord said to Abram, who becomes Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And listen to this, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You see, this blessed church that blesses the nation starts with one blessed man. And one man becomes a blessed family. As you turn in Genesis, go to chapter 28, our second Old Testament reading, and you'll see the family that God reminds of His promise, of what He's going to do throughout the history of the story of the Bible. Genesis 28, 13-14. This man is the grandson of Abraham. And he's having a dream. And in Genesis 28, this is what he sees. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west 
and to the east, and to the north, and to the south, and in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God's promise of blessing the nation starts with a man that becomes a family whose offspring or descendant, Jesus Christ, begins the church as we see here today. We see the blessed church in the New Testament called the Church of Antioch that started all the way in the beginning. God has a plan to bless us. So now we're going to look at what does it look like in the churches, in the Scripture's perspective for a blessed church. What does that kind of church look like? And that's where we're at in the New Testament reading today and what we're going to talk about more in depth. Here is the New Testament church starting in Acts 11, verses 19-30 through 30, and, and moving into Antioch. See how the Lord blesses. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenist also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. And he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Paul. May God bless the reading of His Word. So we see here this church called Antioch and this place called Antioch. Antioch is the third largest city in the Greco-Roman world at the time. The only ones that are bigger, if you're in your head thinking, it is Alexandria and Rome. So it's the third largest. In this place, it's like an abode, a home for gods. Uh, The Greek gods, in fact, because many of them are Greek. The the Greek god of Zeus and Apollos and Poseidon etc., etc. This was a place, a home for the gods, except for today. Today, the one true God steps in, Antioch, and it changes it forever. Today's passage, and what we're going to look at, shows what a blessed church looks like in the Scriptures. I'm going to highlight three signs of a blessed church. How a blessed church begins, how a blessed church responds to success, and how a blessed church responds to to needs. So first one to look at, the church blessed by God, how does it begin? It begins with spreading the gospel. If you look at verses 19 through 21, you'll see that, did you catch why they even are in Antioch? There's persecution. They're being pushed out. In fact, pushed out of where uh, the Jerusalem church is, or pushed out of the Jerusalem area And what they choose to do as they are being challenged and squeezed, if you will, they are sharing the gospel. So think about that for a second. It, I, I say this sometimes. I'm, I'm going to reference a, a few times. I'm a teacher at Carolina Christian School. I teach Bible. And so a few things I say to my classmates I want to share with you. And uh, one of them is I tell them often that if you squeeze a Christian, if you pressure them, if you think of ketchup bottles, it's a silly analogy, but a ketchup bottle, you squeeze it, you're going to get ketchup. If you squeeze a true believer who trust and hopes in Christ, if you squeeze them, if you, go, if you put them in persecution, what you're going to get is Christ. And that's what's happened here. As they're being persecuted and squeezed out of, if you will, Jerusalem, they are, they are spilling out the gospel to the people in Antioch. They share the gospel as it's been foretold. They bless the nations. Remember the Old Testament passage. They're doing what God had always planned. Notice who they shared with. If you look at the text, you might have noticed that that some of them just shared with the Jews. But then others shared with these Hellenists, which is also Greeks, 
um, and, and can be considered Gentiles in other places. So everyone is who they shared with. Some just with the Jews, some with the rest of them. So therefore, maybe in an application, how do you share your faith? What is the gospel? Now if I went around and, and asked that question, you had to give me an answer, I wonder how many different answers we'd get. What is the gospel? When we share it, what does that look like? And, and, and many of them could have the ring of truth to them. But I would, I would argue that there are a few things you need to put in a gospel presentation. And again, as a teacher, I have taught my students this, and, and what is the gospel? If there's a, a time for notes, this might be the one uh, that, that would be appropriate. But the gospel equals the good news. So it's the news of what? I give them a formula. Two beings plus three things equals the gospel. So what are the two beings? The two beings are man and Jesus. Alright, so there's news about these two beings. What is the news about man? Well, the first is good news. We were created by God. And we are image bearers. And the second thing is also good. He created us to have relationship with Him. But then comes the bad news. We didn't want relationship with Him first and foremost. We wanted autonomy. We wanted to be independent. So man was broken in that relationship with God. That's the first part in the news about man. And I give verses, so here's some verses that would connect with the man part. Romans 3.10 and Romans 3.23. They, they highlight very well that we're broken. There's none good. No, not one who is righteous. None who seeks after God on their own. But then you have news about Jesus. That's the second being. What about Jesus? Well, God sent His Son Jesus to bring us back to bring man back into relationship with God. John 3.16 says it pretty clearly. John 14.6 is another passage where Jesus clearly explains that He's the one who was sent with the task to bring us back to God. Okay, so what does that look like? Well, there's three things. And those are death, atonement, and resurrection. So the two beings are man and Jesus. The three things are death, atonement, and resurrection. And important parts of the Gospel. So what's this news about death? Well, it's not just a broken relationship that we have as uh, those who have gone against God. It, there's an eternal consequence to our uh, disobedience and our betrayal of God. Uh, there's a verse that says the wages of our sin is death. Romans 6.23 Well, that death even is separation from God. And it's also called other things and it's explained in other ways in the Bible. This death is, is, is darkness, chaos, hell... Burning anguish. Now, I tell them this, and I think this myself, it's like, wow, sometimes if you really put it down to the, the simplicity of, of one person who lives maybe 70 years and, and sins against God, for the rest of their life they're going to suffer. Does that seem fair? And I, and I put it this way, I don't know who to give credit to, it's not my idea, but I think it makes good sense, this, this idea. If you were to, go ahead and look at your, your uh, next next uh, person uh, sitting next to you. Take a look at them. And, and I'm going to kind of shock you a little bit with what I say next, but just imagine punching them in the face. <laughs> okay, hopefully nobody really could imagine that and just think, oh, that'd be easy. But if you did that, that'd be very awkward. And everybody would kind of look, and we'd probably have to, to deal with it. Maybe you'd come and have meetings with the pastor and like, what happened there? We're not sure. But let's say, you know, there's some consequences of that. Let's say, uh, just because today I'm preaching, let's say you just stop in the middle of the service, you don't like what I say, and you come up and you punch me in the face. It might be a little bit different just because I'm, I'm uh, given the opportunity to preach today. Uh, so maybe the consequences would be a little bit more. Maybe the church might want to press charges. I don't know what our policy is. But let's say that the policeman comes and, and grabs you and, and try because you start hitting everybody. And then the police comes and gets you and you pop the policeman right in the, right, bam, right in the chin, knock him out. You guys are good. You're like Rocky. But nonetheless, it's not good the consequences you get if you hit a policeman. Right? That's like jail time. But I know this never happens, but let's say somebody gets mad at the President of the United States. Okay? And let's say that they make a plan to go up and find a way, and they're successful to go up to the President of the United States. The ones in the past, the one here, I'm just saying the President of the United States. And you pop him in the mouth. It's not jail time, that's prison time. And that's some serious consequences. And on and on it goes. Well, 
we're going up in kind of uh, the idea here, but what about the God who created the world? What about the, the Almighty God who called you to do something, and, and in a sense, we turned around and we betrayed Him? If you sin against an eternal God, death is a just reward. Hell is a just reward. Eternal suffering is a just reward for, for doing that to an eternal God. So it's right. It's hard to think about because we're finite, but it's right. Death. It's the news of death, the news of atonement. What is atonement? It's like reparation or repair, the relationship of God and man. Uh, and basically, Jesus puts Himself in our place. We owe a great debt to God, and it's been called before the great exchange. He steps in our place and says, I'll take the penalty. That's basically what atonement is about. It repairs the relationship. So a verse for the news about death, Romans 6.23. A verse for the news of atonement, Romans 5.8. God showed His love in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's not that we did something, it's that Christ did something. Last, news about the resurrection. And that's the best news. That's what wraps up the good news. What do I mean? Well, we serve Jesus. I, let me say it again. We serve God. It's the same thing. And why do we say that? Well, because we know we serve the One who came down and humiliated Himself, who was powerful and almighty, and put Himself in flesh and came down into our muck, our brokenness, our messed up nature. And He came and He joined us, but He came down not, not with just a soft encouragement. He came down with a strong hand to fix what was broken in us. And He, and he took us back. He, he was putting us back together. And Jesus, He took our dead spirits and made us alive again. How can He do that? Because He made Himself alive again. Because He is the resurrection and the life. John eleven twenty five. 25. Because He has the power to save us and to bring us back home forever. The same eternal God who has the just ability to punish all of us, has also the, the ability to save us forever. That we have a hope that is so much bigger than maybe the 70 years we would live here. The resurrection gives us something to brag about and be super excited about. So the gospel main points, two beings, man and Jesus, and three things, death, atonement, and resurrection. That equals the good news. Okay, so Romans 6.23, I'd give that as maybe a cheater verse. That covers all of them, I think, pretty well. Um, but, but how to share the gospel. I had a conversation one time. Uh, to, to put it in perspective, I was talking with um, some other leaders at a, at a project where people are learning how to share their faith. We kind of go over a lesson, and then they say, all right, you learn how to do evangelism. Now guess what? And we're like, you know, we're going to go to the pool because it's at the beach. And they're like, no, you're going to go to the beach. And we're like, yay, to share your faith. We're like, what? <laughs> And so, I was a leader that year, so I'm bringing around some uh, guys with me who had learned how to say some things about Jesus. Why is it that we're so terrified? Is it because we're more worried about us and what people think about us and what people think about the Lord? I know that's where I was in that moment. And I know that's where these kids were. We walk up and we come up with these six guys uh, at the beach. And I'm like, hey man, can I ask you a question? And he was like, no, because I know what you're going to ask me. I've already had six of you ask me that. I do not want to talk about Jesus or God. I just want to be at the beach. And he kept walking. And I'm sitting here with these six guys, and I'm like, it's all right. You know, the, people aren't really mean to us or anything, and now here we are. And so I'm like, gosh, what, what do I do? And uh, I say, hey, come on. So we, we kind of come back, and I just go back up to the guy, and I say, hey, uh, you know, what's it like that people kind of keep coming up to you? What do you think? What's up with that? Why do you think people keep bothering you about that? Not really what I'd recommend everybody doing, but in that moment, he turned and said, it's a good question. And we had a good conversation, and it, and it ended up uh, being a decent experience for us. But that's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about sharing the gospel. And uh, that was still difficult for me, and those, those aren't the easy ways, but... You all have neighbors, or you all have people that you work with. And you know something, what if we thought God put us in these places for such a time as this for that person to hear the gospel? And they can hear it through how we speak of Him and how we live for Him. And maybe they might end up knowing and calling us Christians. We'll get to that. Alright, the second big idea though. Uh, first, a church begins by sharing the gospel. Uh, to each other and where they live. May locusts hear the gospel more because of you and me. That's the prayer. A church blessed by God responds to success. So this church, if we look in 
verses 22 through 26, we see that, that the Lord was adding to their number. Great numbers were being added. So the Lord's blessing them. They are, in a sense, successful. What do they do? They train and teach the believers. Did you catch that? First off, they go and send someone to investigate named Barnabas and just, wow. Let's take a moment to look at Barnabas and realize what this man has done. He comes in and he sees, he's, he's actually called the son of encouragement. And man, he is. We could all learn from him. We all need people like him to encourage us. But, but one, they call him a good guy in verse 24. If you catch that, you might want to circle that because a good guy is not described anywhere else of any other man who's walking with the Lord. Matter of fact, Jesus, though He is the one true good teacher, uh, teaches that there's no one good. So they call this man good. It's just a highlight that there is something special about him. It's the only time. What can we learn from him? First, he celebrates other success. He comes in. He's not one church. I don't know if you ever get this moment where you see churches doing well and you get a little jealous. Or you see other people doing well and you get a little jealous. But Barnabas sees this person or these people uh, worshiping God and he celebrates with them and he's excited. But the next thing really throws me and is challenging for me and I want to continue to think this way. And it shows great humility. What does he do next? He looks for people who do things better than him. He sees these people need help. A lot of help in teaching and training. And so what does he do? He goes and he gets a guy called Saul, who is also called Paul. Okay, so he goes and he gets Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, and he has him teach these people with him uh, the ways of the Lord. So there's a, another fellow pastor in our presbytery named Kevin DeYoung, and he talks about types of churches. So when churches see success, or what they term as success, these are some ideas of what some churches measure. First, you have the church that's the social club. They're just coming up to see everyone and talk about others. Okay, that's kind of what they do. If I had a good time at church, it was a good social event, that's a blessed time. You have other churches that really highlight social services and justice. Did we, we want to serve, serve, serve. Bible knowledge is secondary to ministry, but we get out there and we do, do, do. And, and success is measured on how much we serve. And then you have social movement churches where really the Bible knowledge is second to politics. We're going to highlight what we believe the Lord is calling us to do in our politics more than in our hearts. Not that the, any of these uh, in the right context can be okay, but good churches. What do good churches do? Good churches are blessed by God when they teach and train their people. When there's success, they don't think about building a building first. They don't think about uh, sharing with the world, like maybe uh, have a conference and we said this, this, and this. You get more people if you do this. They train their people according to this passage right here. How do we train our people at Carolina? Well, there's, there's three I want to highlight. One is Sunday school. Okay, We train our people with good biblical teaching in Sunday school. I've been to all of them. That's one of the things as an assimilation uh, director here that I kind of go and, and spend time in various Sunday school classes. And all of them are good. All of them teach the Bible. All of them you can benefit from. So I uh, encourage you to consider that for training and teaching. Also we have small groups, which uh, the information's in the back for both of these. And uh, we do that. That's, that's really, uh, in a sense, fellowship around biblical questions and teaching. The last thing we do to teach and train our people, uh, or one of the other things that we do, it's not a last thing, we have many things. We have Wednesday evening uh, meals together sometimes at the end of the month. Uh, we also have a, uh, something that we do with the community, a Wednesday morning Bible study. Um, I think this is funny. Here's a promotion for uh, the Bible study on Wednesday mornings. It's at 6.30 a.m. Uh, we're going to study in, in the summer month of June, 6.30 a.m. on Wednesdays, and we're studying the book of Leviticus. So who wants to come? <laughs> but these are options. Sunday school and small groups are church-sanctioned things that we do to teach and train our people. Uh, but you can hear more about those um, and, and, and be a part of it. So let's, let's highlight something here. Nobody's going to do any of these things if they're not hungry. Notice that the church is, is seeking to teach and train people, but notice that the people are sitting under leadership. Notice that they are hungry. The people who are coming to the Lord in Antioch are learning. They're in the teaching time for the duration of a year. They're, they're focused. They have an appetite. They're Christians uh, in this time, and, and I think in a big way, we have to notice that they were called Christians. They weren't 
Like, we're going to call ourselves Christians. They were called Christians. That means people looked at them and saw something different. And a lot of people say the term Christian was derogatory. It wasn't like they were saying, you guys are great, we're going to call you Christians. But it was like, you guys are odd, we've got, just got to name you something. And so, but they were odd enough to be called Christians. Notice what they're called. Notice who they're associated with. Even though, in a sense, they're odd, they're associated with Jesus Christ. If someone had to term me or you, what would they call you? What would be the first thing that they might say about you? You are a what? They are Christians. What would it look like for us in our community here at Locust? Individually, what would we be called? Well, one of the things that I think they're doing that makes them this way is they're sharing the gospel with each other. They're committed to learning about God and the Bible, and they're serving others. So the first thing that a blessed church does when they begin, they're sharing the gospel. The second thing, they train and teach their people. The third thing uh, to highlight is a blessed church responds to others' needs. Catch where they're sending help at the end of this passage, verses 27 and 30. They're sending it back to Judea. The place where they're persecuted and pushed out of, they're sending it back to their fellow Christians that are still serving in that place. It's beautiful that these Greek Christians, you've got to get this too. In Antioch, there's a lot of non-Jewish Christians. And so if we were in the, the, the frame of wanting to not cross cultural lines, we're not going to go to other people, other ethnicities, or other geographical areas. We're going to stay here. But what they did, these Greek Christians that, that knew their, their Jewish brothers back in Judea needed help, they decide to help them. It's Greeks back to Jews. What do we see here? God reaches beyond geographical and ethnic lines. And so it is with a church locally called West Charlotte Church. This is where our, church, uh, this is where our pastor is at right now. He's encouraging that church. What is that church doing? They're in a poverty-stricken place, and it's multi-diverse. It, 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 there's diversity everywhere, and they are seeking to bring the gospel there to teach and train these people and to encourage them, and it's growing. That's just one example of what we see people doing today that I think looks a lot like what people did in Antioch. All right, they share their greatest resources even. Um, not their money. They send Paul and Barnabas. They're great teachers. So what must have been happening in the second thing that they were doing is they must have been training up leaders. They must have had others who could teach, and that's something that a church needs to do in training and teaching is build up other leaders. But ultimately, so the third thing is they respond to others' needs. They hear about needs and they're willing to serve. But ultimately, a church blessed by God is successful because God is on the move. A blessed church is blessed because God's hand is on it. Read verse 21 with me. Okay, verse 21 says, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believe turned to the Lord. The hand of the Lord is unique in the New Testament, and only Luke employs it. So we need to zoom in here and take a look. The hand of God is powerful. And what's it trying to say? It's saying God is on the move. God is the one who gets the credit for the church growing. God is the one who blesses church, and God is the one who makes church's blessings for other people. Remember Genesis 12. God blessed Abraham, and He said, you will be a blessing to others. This blessing, we're not, I've heard this said, Paul David Tripp says, we're not containers of grace. We're conduits of grace. Grace flows through us to others. And that is what's happening in this passage because the hand of the Lord was with them and was moving through them. Okay, all over the world. Because God's on the move, they get to witness and be a part of this kingdom expansion. All over the world today, Christ followers are going through difficulties, but God is on the move, and He was on the move in Antioch. They were successful with evangelism because God was on the move. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if the PCA is seen as successful, it's because God is on the move in that denomination. Carolina Prez is doing well. Why? Because God is on the move here. One blessing I want to highlight, because I'm also a worship director, uh, we do something here, if you look in the bulletins, of a, of a worship philosophy. And, and it's odd. I'm telling you, we're odd. We're different in that we decide we want to love each other 
in a way of worship preference, which is the number one thing that churches split on often. But we come together and we say yes to the other preference. We want to worship like you worship. And yes to the other preference. We want to worship like you worship. And what we see is that God is continuing to bless. I've been so encouraged that the church is growing, and that's kind of odd. It's called blended worship. Uh, is maybe a lay term for it, but God is growing us. That's, some, that's special, and we ought to celebrate that. But the blessing that we have, and the blessing that they had in that time, it didn't bring pride, it brought worship. God is doing it, He's on the move, the hand of the Lord is with us. So to wrap up here, I want to tell one other quick story that's in the Bible. It's of a man named Lazarus, okay? So Lazarus comes, uh, is very sick, and Jesus kind of uh, gets there a little later than others wanted him to, and Lazarus is dead. Well, Jesus, when he makes a prayer, he basically uh, gives the glory and the power uh, is from God, and what happens? He raises Lazarus from the dead. Well, what happens next is clear. Lazarus doesn't say, I'm awesome. You know, he was dead. He was, he was in darkness. But then Christ came. And there's light. He, was, he, he, he wasn't even suffering. He was gone. There was nothing. And then Christ came. And there was life. These Christians that were persecuted, they, they were sent out. And they had really not much to offer. But Christ went with them, and the church expanded. You might be in a difficult place. You might feel like there's darkness coming in your camp. But if Christ comes, He'll give you hope. He'll give you peace. He'll give you life. He'll give you something bigger than what the moment says. And what does that do for us? By God's mighty hand, we see that Jesus brings dead things to life. By God's mighty hand, He has raised up His universal church of which, of which this blessed church is a part of. God blesses churches by His mighty hand and they share the gospel, study the scriptures, and serve. Our church is growing in these things. We're not perfect, but we're growing. Our church is blessed because God is on the move. So we say, all praise from a blessed church be to our most blessed God who grew and is growing this church. Locust, we are the ends of the earth. Carolina, we are the ends of the earth. Praise God. We are blessed because He is on the move. Let's pray.